Okay, I guess we can start actually. So we'll be on time. Okay, so welcome everyone to the session B2 of iCal virtually. And we are going to have a series of exciting talks, starting by a talk with Ram Duan on scaling algorithms for weighted factors. Okay, so Ron, can you share your screen? Okay, so uh... Okay, uh, can, can, can you see it? Uh, yes. Do you want to put it in a... Yes, perfect. Okay, so I start whenever you are ready. Okay, so our paper is about uh, algorithms for the weighted f factors in, in general graphs. So it's, uh, it's a joint work with Hao Xinghe and Tian Yi Zhang, uh, all of us are from Tsinghua University. So, so we consider the uh, a general simple graph. Uh, general is not 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 necessarily bipartite. And simple is that every uh, between every pair of vertices, there's just only at most one edge. And so I factor. So we have a, a degree constraint function f on the vertices. So every vertex has a degree constraint has a uh, that is a neutral number uh, assigned to it. So here, uh, F matching is that a subgraph in which the degree uh, of the vertex V in this subgraph F is at most FV. So F factor is F matching such that all these degree constraints hold with equality. That is, every uh, degree of every vertex is, is just matched FB with uh, edges. So I factor it just uh, as a general generalized matching problem. So we want to find the maximum weight I factor. Like a I factor which maximizes uh, the total, the sum of the edge weights in it. So our So the result of our work is that we give the algorithm of random time like m times times n to the uh, two over three times log w. Here n, n is the number of vertices, m is the number of edges, and we consider the graph in which has integer edge weights between one and w. So you can see our result is independent of FV. And so, so this is the first such result that weighs uh, M times N uh, on, on general graphs. Originally, Garber and Tyden gives such an algorithm for the graph, but we uh, make it to work on uh, uh, also a general, general graph. So our technique is we use the generalized balsa, like I garble and, and combining it with the scaling algorithms for, for, for matching. And so, okay, so this is our, our work. So, so any questions? Okay, thank you. So let's clap virtually. Good. Okay, so are there any questions? Well, I do have a question. So if you go, yeah, no, at, at this page that you have on, it's good. Um, so you got the new factor n to the two thirds and m in compared to other results. So what, what do you think? Uh, are there some of the three factors that you could reduce or get rid of in future work? I do mean future work. Yes, um, so what do you think? Which is the easiest factor? This like M and N sort of belong together and then you have the log. So could you use this M times N to the two thirds? Do you think that this could be 
reduce in the future? Uh, yes, I, I think neutrally maybe we can have m times square root of fw, fb, like such mm -hmm. time complexity. And because for, for original matching, the, the matching problem is like m times square root of n, right? Times log n w. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether, whether this generalized matching also can have such m times square root of n. But I think m times square root of f, fv is uh, not, yes, not, yes, not it's, it's very nice to get rid of that. And another problem called B, B matching, it is uh, every edge can be counted multiple times. It's also like a subgraph, but but every uh, edge can be counted multiple times. And I, I, I don't know whether it can, can have a like, like, like uh, time complexity like that. Okay. Is there any other question? So actually I had one question also for you. Is this result also work for maximum weight? F like F matching or or B matching basically. I I don't know I, I don't know uh, I, I think it may we may have algorithm for B matching like this many time but but it will be even harder even uh, more complicated. Also, oh, B matching is harder than finding the factors. Yes, uh, yes, I think so. Because it, this works on, like, if we pick a subgraph of like n to the one third of vertices, then the number of edges in it is like n to the two third. Mm -hmm. But B matching, if an uh, edge can count multiple times, you can have this property. I see. Okay. okay. Good. So let's see. Okay, yeah, sure. So if there are no other questions, we can move to the next talk. Uh, and I think Andras, are you giving the next talk? Yes, I am. Okay. So please uh, start sharing your screen. Sure. Uh, just find it. Screen. Okay. And Is it visible? Yes. It looks good. Okay. Great. Okay. So okay. yeah. Please. Okay. Thanks. So hi everybody. If you recall, this talk was about these financial networks where banks are having contracts to each other, and we can have networking effects that cascade through the whole system. And in this system, we could define the assets of each bank, uh, like as the money that the bank has and the one it receives from its incoming debts and the liabilities of the bank, which is the outgoing debts and like contracts it has to pay. And based on this, if a bank can fulfill its payment obligations, then it's fine. Uh, and if it cannot, then we say it's bankrupt or, or in default. And in this case, uh, we can look at how much liabilities it still is able to pay. And we were analyzing these systems. And to make the model a bit more powerful and realistic, we also included these conditional debt contracts, uh, for which the simplest example is this credit default swap from real life markets, where uh, the the payment obligation only happens if a specific third bank is in default. So this is something that banks can use as, as insurance or just a way of, of speculating on the market. And we've seen a simple example that with this, you can have multiple solutions in the system. And sometimes some banks prefer some of these solutions, others prefer other ones. So it's 
it can raise a lot of interesting situations. And our main goal was a, uh, just a, a basic survey of what kind of game theoretic operations are banks uh, incentivized to make in this setting and, and what kind of situations this can lead to. And we've seen some examples for operations where, where banks can um, uh, change the single solution of the system in a way that's beneficial for them. Uh, for example, simply by giving away money to another bank or removing an, a debt contract that's incoming for them. And then we've also seen some examples for other operations where banks cannot create a new solution, but they are still maybe able to select one from two solutions by effectively invalidating one solution of the system. Uh, one example for this was uh, like readjusting the priorities of outgoing payments, but also investing more funds into your bank was in this category. And then we've looked at some simple examples where two nodes doing these operations uh, result in game theoretic situations. For example, in this volunteers dilemma, uh, both banks would want some donations to arrive at this bank U, but then again, both of them would prefer the other bank to donate because then they are a bit better off. And in a very similar set, uh, fashion, we can also create a prisoner's dilemma, a dollar auction, or many other uh, popular games. So yeah, that's for the brief recap. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. OK, thanks, Andras. And again, virtual clapping. OK, so any questions? So we did get a question in on the Slack channel. It's asked by Andrea Torini in behalf of Liang Zhang. Thank you for the interesting talk. We know that the debt out by the bank grows over time. Given that the debt is dynamically changing and the growth rate of the debt between different banks is different, can your allocation method take this into account when arranging priorities? Uh, yes. So I just read this question. So first of all, uh, we're so in our work, we are only considering the, the simplest setting where we only look at one specific state of the system. So of course, if you want to make this more realistic, and of course, that's the long term goal, then it's very interesting to look at how the system evolves. Uh, and, and that's, uh, that's a nice direction to go. Uh, but, but the results we have are already, uh, they already hold in these static systems where, where you just look at one, uh, one state of the system and that can already produce these complex situations. So I'm not entirely sure what you mean by this fact that the, the debt owed by the bank grows over time. But may, so this, this can either refer to the fact, I guess, that that uh, you can introduce time limits on debt, and if you don't pay them, then then uh, then maybe it's more costly in some sense, or or a bank may take up further loans in in the future. Uh, but then, if you would want to extend the model that way, uh, you would probably also want to change the external assets of the bank. So it owes more, but it gets more money when it takes up a new loan. So so these are all possible further directions, which which we did not, did not consider yet. About this last part of uh, allocation method, so I would want to clarify that we didn't look at a specific um, allocation method of, of readjusting priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we've just shown some si simple examples where, where this can be beneficial and seen what the limit of these options are or what, it, what they can do, what they cannot do, but uh, what we didn't consider a specific algorithm uh, as to how a node should readjust its priorities. And I assume that would probably be a hard problem. You can probably easily show that it's uh, MP hard to find that even in, in simpler definitions of this problem. And I think actually there's a, there's a work by Berchinger and others in, in this year's ITCS about looking into this in detail in the, in the 
model where you only have simple depths. Uh, and even there, it's, it's quite a complex question. So, so, so just to, to clarify, we did not propose a specific algorithm, uh, but based on how you extend the model by changing depths, that would probably be an interesting question, I agree. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, then let's thank Andras again and we can move to the next talk. And I think Aaron, are you presenting the talk? Yes. So please share your slides. Okay. Uh, Good. Okay. Okay. Well, this should be as well. Okay. Uh, so this is the recap for the paper uh, Robust Algorithms for TSP and Steiner Tree. And this is joint work with Bruce Maggs and Amalia Panagrahi, uh, who I believe is here. Uh, so in this paper, we consider our graph minimization model for graph optimization problems like TSP and Steiner tree. So let's say we want to solve Steiner tree on this graph. However, we don't actually know exact edge lengths for every edge due to some uncertainty in practice. And so we only have predictions for lower and upper bounds on each edge length. And we'd like to now choose a solution such that the solution is sort of robust to every possible setting of edge lengths that falls within the, the ranges. So let's say I've chosen this solution in the bold edges, let's call this ELG. And I wanna evaluate how robust is this solution to the uncertainty in the input. So the way that I'll do this is once I commit to my solution, I'll imagine that some adversary chooses the true edge lengths and reveals them to me. And if the adversary wants to make my solution look as poor as possible, they'll choose to maximize all the edge lengths in my solution and minimize all the other edge lengths. And now the way that I'll evaluate the solution is I'll look at what the optimal solutions cost is for the set of edge lengths that the adversary revealed. And I'll say that I suffer regret equal to the difference between the cost of ALG and the cost of OPT. So in this example, ALG paid nine more than the optimal solution did. So ALG has regret nine. This is effectively saying nine was the cost of not having perfect information here for this solution. And so if I let uh, MR denote the minimum regret across all solutions, our goal is to come up with a solution which has regret at most MR or maybe some multiple of MR ideally. However, for NFU hard problems, this turns out not to be doable. So in this paper, we introduce a new notion of regret for this, applying this model to NPR problems, where we say that a solution is an alpha beta regret approximation. If for any setting of the edge weights, the cost of our solution is at most alpha times the cost of the optimal solution for that set of edge weights, plus beta times the minimum regret achieved by any solution. And we show that for TSP and Steiner tree, there are poly time approximation algorithms where alpha and beta are both constant. And in particular, this is notable because this is the first poly time algorithm giving sort of any reasonable approximation guarantee for NBR problems under this model. Uh, so that's it for the recap. Uh, and I guess I'll start taking questions now. Okay, perfect. Thanks for the talk. Um, Okay, are there any questions from the audience? Quick question for solving um, generalized uh, network design. So was the main issue actually uh, separating the dual or something? Or, or what was the main issue to, to get it generalized? Yeah, um, so the technical challenge for these problems is uh, I can maybe go into more detail in the Slack, but we have to write and we have to basically write an LP and solve it. And solving it actually is the non-trivial part because um, I guess the game you're sort of playing when you're solving the LP is you're playing the role of the adversary and you're trying to come up with a high regret real or you're trying to come up with a good adversarial solution for whatever the fractional solution the LP is. And doing this sort of requires for Steiner tree, for example. Um, stronger approximation algorithms than what you would use for the classical problems. So just a standard two approximation for Steiner tree doesn't suffice. You need something more detailed. 
Uh, and it's unclear of what the techniques we use to solve, uh, to get the stronger approximation are for Steiner tree. Um, it's unclear if these techniques can be generalized since we derived them from uh, some, uh, I, I guess maybe that's enough for now and I can go into more detail in the Slack. Thanks, no, that, that, that's exciting. I think I have a close look at the paper. Okay, thanks. great. So I also had one question. Do you know if there are connections between your work and this problem such as universal TSP or universal Steiner tree? Yeah, so um, I guess I do think there are sort of uh, conceptual connections in that uh, in both settings, we're trying to be very, uh, we're trying to basically come up with a solution that's good for every possible input. Um, so I guess what's less clear is if, for example, a universal algorithm implies a alpha beta approximation in our setting or vice versa. Uh, but I guess, uh, I do think there's a connection in that. And actually, I guess uh, we have some unpublished work where we do sort of address this. So uh, there are some problems where it seems like if you're allowed to, if you're allowed this additional slack on the minimum regret, then in the universal algorithm, alpha might have to be something very large, some very large final polynomial or infinite, and you can get it down to constant. Um, so I think that's what the main connections are and maybe what the, uh, main benefits of introducing this model to the space are. Yes. And are there some variation of these problems? Like now that we have universal set cover, is there also a robust version of set cover, for instance? Yeah, so um, I guess uh, I think this model is fairly general. So I think you could, we can very easily define universal set, or I guess uh, set cover under this model. Um, I think it's, uh, I guess one thing we're using in our techniques is that for TSP and Steiner tree, the costs of the solutions are linear functions of uh, the uncertain variables. And for something like universal set cover, um, I guess the cost is not quite linear because you only pay for a set, I guess, for example, if a set covers two elements, then your cost is going to be zero if neither element appears, and then one if at least one of the elements appears. Mm -hmm. So it's unclear if our techniques would generalize to that setting where you don't want to pay for a set if none of the elements it covers appears. Um, but it, it's entirely possible that there's work to be done there. Do you know? So so these are the first MP hard problems that have been studied in this in this model, yes? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in, for polytime algorithms, yeah. I see. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, then I guess we should move to the next talk and thanks okay. again, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, um, stop sharing, yeah. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I'm having some difficulty stopping the sharing. I can I stop it? Okay, stop sharing. Oh, okay, thanks. Can everyone see this? Yes, good. So, oh, okay. Good. So, is the, so you and Juan Lee are going to give the talk together? Or? Uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to do it together. And is Juan here also? Uh, I think so. Yeah, he's here. Juan. Okay, I'm going. I can start it. Okay, sure. Uh, start. Yeah, uh, I'm Hesam, and we are gonna talk about stochastic load balancing problem with Poisson jobs. Uh, this is a joint work with Juan and our advisors, Anindya De and Sanjeev Khan. Uh, um, we start by defining the deterministic version of the problem. Suppose we have n jobs and each job has a running time or as we call it size. 
we can assign these jobs to M machines and the load of a machine would be the sum of its assigned job sizes. The goal is minimizing the maximum load. The stochastic version is the same, except that we don't know the running time exactly, and they are actually random variables. But we know that it's their distributions. In this case, uh, the load of a machine would be a random variable as it is some of some random variables, and the maximum load would be again a random variable. So the goal would be minimizing expected maximum load. Uh, our main result is that we show that when uh, the random variables follow Poisson distributions, there is an efficient polynomial time approximation scheme for the problem. Uh, previously, a two approximation is known, and uh, this is the first efficient p-test in the stochastic load balancing problem. For the future work, we were wondering if we can use our uh, results, especially the independent Poisson concentration result to solve some op optimization problem related to Poisson random variables. And also the case of Bernoulli jobs where uh, each job follows from a Bernoulli random variables might be of an interest. And that's it. Okay, thanks for the talk. Good. So let's hear if there are any questions from the audience first. Yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so in the future directions, yeah, you mentioned Bernoulli jobs. So I was wondering that what does make Bernoulli more promising? Do you already know that some of your ideas can be applied in this case or what the barriers are? Uh, my Bernoulli case, uh, so there's a constant approximation algorithm for the general problem by uh, Rabboni, Tardush, and Kleinberg. By general, I mean uh, the distributions can be arbitrary. Uh, they highly uh, used, actually they solved the problem first for Bernoulli jobs. And by using that, they solved the problem for the general case. So we thought maybe by solving, by getting a good approximation for the Bernoulli jobs, we might get some good approximations for many general uh, cases. And no, we couldn't adapt our ideas to the Bernoulli case. Uh, the reason is that uh, many basic properties that we used is might not be true in the Bernoulli jobs. Like, um, let, let me explain it a, a bit more. So for example, uh, generally we expect that as the load, as the loads gets, get close to each other, the uh, expected maximum would decrease. Like uh, for, for deterministic case, if you have three loads with loads three, four, and five, and we make all of them four, the expected maximum would decrease from five to four. And also for Poisson jobs, three Poisson random variables with three, four, and five, the expected maximum of them is some number. Uh, but when we make them four, and four, and four, the expected maximum would decrease, but it's Interestingly, it might not be true for the uh, Bernoulli case. When we uh, close the loads, the expected maximum would actually increase. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Uh, I can ask one more question regarding the running time. So you mentioned that there already a p-test was known for, for the deterministic case. So is your running time as good as the one that was already there for, for deterministic case? Can you get close to that? No, it's not. It's not the same. Uh, so uh, our running time is double exponential. 
like when we want to get an error of one plus epsilon, our running time is something like two to the two to the order of one over epsilon plus o tile of n. But the best um, but the best running time for the deterministic case is single exponential. It's something like two to the o tile of one over epsilon plus o tile of n. So you know it's not the same. And actually, it might be a, a interesting future direction. Thank you. And has some here, what are some other distributions that make sense to look beside Poisson or Bernoulli? So uh, the paper which provided the two approximation, they also provided uh, a p-test, actually not an efficient one, but a p-test uh, for exponential distributions but they couldn't get anything for the Bernoulli case. I see. And do you know if we pick the distributions to be independent but arbitrary, are the lower bounds that show that you cannot do anything good? Uh, we couldn't find that, but it might be really interesting, yeah. So now here the distribution is, so for instance, no, I guess in Poisson random distributions, you're using more than the fact that you can sample from the distribution. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot. Okay. So if there are no more questions, we should move to the next talk. And good. Should I stop? Yes, please. Uh, good. So do we have any of the speakers for the talk B2E? Ilan, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Okay, perfect. Good. Good. Are you ready? Hey, sure, give me a second. Sure. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, this talk is about online two-dimensional load balancing with John Paul with Sanji Mim and Demalia Panagiri. I think Demalia is also online. So we study the problem of vector load balancing, where we need to assign jobs to M identical machine, where each job is a D-dimensional vector. Here's an example with uh, where the vectors are three-dimensional, and we need to assign them to a three uh, to three-dimensional bins in a way that minimizes the max span. The max man is the maximum loaded coordinate in any machine. So we study the online version of the of the problem where uh, the algorithm must uh, uh, the vectors arrive one after the other, and the algorithm must immediately and irrevocably assign to the next the next vector to a machine. So uh, one is the algorithm, the grid algorithm where you, we we assign them uh, the the, to the machine, which minimizes the maximum, the current maximum load. So we can go past the quick example of the grid algorithm. So when the next vector arrives, we will choose the machine that minimizes the maximum load. And while there are a lot of result for this problem in the one-dimensional case, uh, there are several of, uh, of papers the best result for and uh, they distinguish between uh, unknown opt and non opt, and there are several results on the on the general case when t the when t is general actually there, there are a tight result up to a constant for the case where uh, g is uh, where, where d is arbitrarily large. While in practice uh, the number of uh, the number of dimension is small and there, there is lack of literature in that field. Uh, just for the practical case. So we were able to show uh, to show some results when the number uh, the number of dimension is uh, larger than one, but 
still a fixed small number of dimension. So we first study the, the problem where, uh, uh, where the number of dimension is two. And we show that uh, uh, the greedy is better than three is three, the, 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 the obvious lower bound. And by using some the kind of general approach, we're able to, to analyze uh, uh, various algorithms, best fit and first fit, and we achieve uh, 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 we achieve much better results than the than the naive approach. And the, the second part of our results is to show that one can achieve uh, in, in, in theory almost the best competitive ratio possible. We are able to show that if the best fractional uh, uh, fractional competitive ratio is uh, alpha star, we are able to, to show that we are able to, uh, to achieve a way one plus epsilon approximation to this to this competitive. This is by using much more robust approach and, uh, and uh, computing an offline matter, some kind of uh, decision tree, but this is also uh, theoretically interesting. And so, so in general, we, we, we studied the problem of, uh, of uh, a uh, vector load balancing when the number of dimension is uh, is, is, is fixed by but but small, and we show a couple of really interesting theoretical results on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good. So, any questions? I wanted to ask a question. Go ahead. Please. Um, it's in the Slack actually, but I figured I'd ask it here as well. Um, I was curious, so in the talk, you basically show that for these different priority functions, you can figure out the approximation, approximation ratio by figuring out the reachability space yeah. of that priority function. And yeah. I was curious to what extent, so you do this for several different priority functions. I was curious to what extent this is black box. Like, do you basically have a, a formula where I give you any priority function and you can, just do some immediate calculation and figure out the reachability space? Or is it more like a high level technique that you have to adapt to every particular priority function? Yeah, actually because the number of dimension is small and we were able to reduce the problem to a small number of machine. Uh, so we first do some kind of a brute force algorithm. So uh, a brute force PFS uh, like algorithm in order to understand the reachable space. So, because of we didn't, uh, of course, any BFS uh, or BFS like algorithm has got uh, like uh, uh, like uh, you, you you cannot uh, try all the possible vectors. You need to discretize it somehow. But after we understand what what the, the reachable space, we are able to to show some bounding hyperspace in order to theoretically bound it. But essentially, uh, just by using the the brute force support of the PFS algorithm, you can uh, you can uh, you can figure out what the what the competitive ratio of the algorithm. Is. Okay, cool. So Thanks. you can you can use any priority function in in this BFS and then to understand and then later you can you can prove it by 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 a technique like we used in the paper. But then you're still not sure. So then the issue is you just don't know what the right priority function is. Uh, yeah, but so. In the second part of the paper, we can say that you can actually, uh, you can look for the best priority-based function. So you can just use uh, some brute force. If you have uh, enough uh, uh, computing resource, you can just look for the best uh, priority function or, or even any function for a small number of machines. Uh, okay. And do, do you know then what the approximation ends up being if you do that? Uh, no, because... The, while it's uh, theoretically possible, it still really uh, uh, will require a lot of computing resources. OK, so got it. Any other questions? Yes, so uh, I also posted a question on, on Slack, um, but of course, I can ask also here. Um, so. Um, you measure somehow this make span for, for each machine, but I was wondering if you also can combine these, these multiple dimensions that you have in, in some other way, like 
um, looking at the average of of each dimension or just taking the sum of each dimension yeah yeah actually all the all the techniques in the paper can be generalized to any not just to, to max pen but to any lp norms for example i know there are several papers that are interested in minimize the lp norms obviously you might need the different priority function to minimize them but essentially uh, essentially the in the paper we show that uh, uh, for this kind of algorithm, you can look at um, a small number of uh, machines. So if if your if your uh, goal function also can be measured by a small number of of, uh, of machines, then all these techniques can be used also for these cases. Okay, thank you. So one quick question I had about your second result, also, Elon. Yeah. Is uh, is that so you are saying you can get a polynomial time algorithm that approximate the best online algorithm here yeah. so so we have like so we first showed that we are uh, with uh, some previous techniques we are able to mini to reduce the number of uh, of uh, machines from uh, arbitrary number to a uh, polylog uh, uh, d but fixed so for, for we, we assume that the, the number of dimension is fixed, so we can be uh, even if we're exponential in the number of dimension. So we first, using using some previous techniques, show that we can reduce the number of uh, uh, to uh, polar logarithmic number of uh, of a machine if if the if the dimension is fixed, and then we show that uh, one can compute the best and. Uh, 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 the best decision tree. So now, when you have a small number of, uh, of machines, the question when the next vector arrives, so of course, there is some discretizing issue that we are able to solve, but the main issue is to compute the, the big, so one can, uh, the big, uh, uh, the big decision tree. And because, uh, uh, and and this decision tree uh, uh, actually will will approximate opt because we know that if we are able to, to show the, the optimal uh, decision tree, so and and uh, the, the other issue is the, the one plus epsilon. This is also uh, from a discretizing issue. So mm -hmm. in order to we cannot obviously compute all vectors, so we discretize the, the vectors and. We also need uh, to show how to deal with the small vectors. There are a lot of technical issues, but that's the core of the result. I see. Got it. Okay, thanks. So is there any other question? Okay, so thanks again, Ilan, and I think we can move to the last talk. Yeah, and so last talk is by Sandra, and she's going to give the talk. Okay, thank you. So I hope you can see my slides and hear me. Um, our submission is about the iteration number of color refinement, which for those who don't know it is um, a procedure mainly used to classify vertices of graphs or graphs or entire graphs. Um, and the general idea is to compute colors in iterations assigned to the vertices and so that you know, or so that whenever two vertices have different colors, you know that there is no isomorphism mapping the first to the second vertex. So for example, here in this, um, these two graphs, this blue vertex here cannot be mapped to this red vertex because the blue vertex has just one neighbor and the red vertex has three neighbors. So by an isomorphism, this, is, this would not be possible. And as I said, the algorithm proceeds in iterations. This is the criterion that is applied in each iteration. And it says that two vertices get different colors if there is some color such that the neighborhood with respect to this color looks different. So here in this, itera uh, in this example, in the first iteration, the end vertices will get a different color because they are the only ones that have just one black neighbor. So for example, blue. And then in the next iteration, the neighbors of the blue vertices get another color than the other black vertices because they have a blue neighbor. And then the neighbors of the green vertices get a new color. 
And until we're in this stage, and you can check that when you apply or try to apply the refinement criterion again, nothing will happen. So this is kind of stable. And it took us length of this path over two iterations to get to this stage. So the question that arises is how many iterations does this algorithm take on any input graph of a certain size, let's say n, um, if it's not a path. And um, here the first column summarizes what was known before our publication. Um, basically, there was a lower bound uh, constructed with counterexamples, and um, the trivial upper bound of n minus one was not known to be to be tight. So this is the question that we tackled. And we could actually improve the lower bound to n minus two for graphs of order n. And the upper bound, we could, as to the upper bound, we could show that it's actually tied for infinitely many n. And more precisely, not just infinitely many n, but whenever n satisfies these conditions, there is a graph with n vertices on which we need n minus one iterations. So the trivial upper bound is tight in this case. And we achieve this, uh, this theorem um, by explicit constructions of graphs. So we developed a string representation like this one here and also a compact graphical representation. And these allowed us to construct infinite families of such long refinement graphs. Um, yeah, which we could use to show that uh, our theorem holds. And um, with the thring, string representation, some example graphs look like this. So it's all infinite families here, except for the first one. And this is a summary. So um, the very short version of our, main, of our main result is this one here. So we have infinitely many n for which this bound is tight. We have some partial negative results um, for the numbers that we could not cover yet. And the, at the bottom here, you have some open questions to work on yourself. And um, I'm happy to take your questions. OK, thank you. And um, are there any questions? Yes, uh, there is a question. So what are your expectations? So do you expect those long refinement graphs exist for all uh, for all orders? Or um, I'm thinking there might be some word actually does not exist. So uh, the smallest um, size that we could not yet cover is this one here, n, n equal to 24. But there is no reason, or we don't see any reason why this size should not be covered. So it's basically because our families, they are infinite, but they have some gaps. So when you, we, when you add some vertices, they increase by six, for example. So we could not cover the 24. Um, and basically, due to computational exhaustion, we could not uh, check all graphs on 24 vertices. But I do believe there are some, some of such graphs. And I would be very interested in seeing some, but we haven't found them yet. But I am quite sure there are some with higher degrees. So we have some partial negative results there for some. Um, so you can show that uh, you need two different degrees in the graphs, not more, not less. Um, and for some degree pairs, we have negative results there. But uh, yeah, there's a lot to be covered still. Any other question? So I'm not familiar with this area, but let me ask you something that might be related. So what will happen if you want to look at the two-step neighborhood of vertices? And so you want to so you neighborhood? What is that? So now currently you define your name, like the criteria for two vertices is that their neighbors should have a different set of colors. Then you have to color these vertices different. Mm -hmm. What if I look at the vertices which are at distance two from every vertex? Um, so, um, so you mean just distance two and not distance one? No. Um, like both? Both so, both um, so this uh, there are higher dimension higher dimensional versions of this algorithm, and as long as so this is the one dimensional version, and as soon as you go to dimension two, you can in a way capture distances um, between vertices, but for um, dimension one. Um, so when, when you have one vertex and you look at the neighborhood in the next iteration, the neighbors of these neighbors will also influence the color of this vertex, yes. but, um, it will not, so it will not know much about the distance between them because they might, it's just walks that are, are considered and not paths. So you can have vertices, um, visited more than once on such a 
walk. So, um, I mean, uh, for distance two, I mean, I guess if you want to consider distance two, you would have to consider distance one as well. Otherwise, it will probably be quite chaotic. Your yeah, water would just case, walk soft land to even, not necessarily distance. Um, walks of length two. Yeah, it's a bit weird to, um, I, how would you define this algorithm then? Um, it would take, so, so you would want to color vertices differently if the set, or there's a multi set of colors that you can reach with, with walks of length two is different. Yes. Um, I guess this is a, I think this is, I guess the criterion is too strong. I'm not sure, but I guess the criterion is too strong because it will distinguish. Um, yeah, wait, walks of length two. So, yeah, no, actually, so if you consider walks of length two and you, um, this is something that, this is actually, I think this, is, this corresponds to two, two iterations of the algorithm. Because in one iteration, it considers the vertices at distance one, and they themselves consider their neighbors um, in one iteration. And the information that they gather from these neighbors, do you know, do you understand what I mean? So if I have one vertex and I consider the neighbors in one iteration, and for these vertices, I also consider their neighbors, then in the next iteration, I will consider the walks of length two. So I, I guess it's the same as performing um, just two iterations of the iteration. same. I see. Okay, thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned the higher dimensional version. So that's the k-dimensional Weisfeiler uh, Lehman uh, algorithm. So do your results uh, generalize to a natural iteration number for uh, for the higher dimensional version as well? And, and um, if so... Um, so let me go back. Um, so yeah, I went through this a bit quickly because I had restricted time, but here you can see, so in the second column and the third column, you have the higher dimensional versions. And as you can see, so this here, this upper bound here um, was a result obtained in 2019. And um, it shows that the, the trivial upper bound would be n to the two minus one, because that's how often you can partition the set of tuples that you're considering. Um, and here, this shows that it's clearly not tight, um, this trivial upper bound. Here, um, this upper bound is also not tight just because you, the initial tuples that you're considering already have uh, more than two different types. Um, but yeah, it's a bit uh, tedious to compute the, the trivial upper bound that you get from this observation, but you know that this is not tight. So, this was actually why this was kind of surprising because we would be expected that it's not tight since we knew these two are not, uh, the, the trivial upper bounds here are not tight. Um, this was kind of surprising that it's actually tight and not just tight for some graph orders, but for infinitely many and let's say quite infinitely many. Um, as to the lower bounds, um, yeah, also as the table shows, there is only this, this, trivi this uh, not trivial, this linear lower bound um, shown by Führer for higher dimensions, and it has not yet been improved. So there are some results uh, when you consider not graphs, but relational structures in general, but for graphs, this is the best that's known so far. And um, the nice thing about the one dimensional version is that you can, uh, you can understand quite well how the information spreads through the graph. So basically by these walks and always just considering neighborhoods and the, the higher dimensional versions, they have the problem that you consider um, tuples of vertices that are can be very far away in the graph or can be very close so it doesn't consider just adjacent vertices and it's it's I think this is one of the one of the major reasons why this lower bound has not yet been improved and it's not clear how we could apply these findings to get good lower bounds for the higher dimensional versions. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay so Thanks to all the speakers in this session, and I think we should just finish this session. Thank you everyone for attending.